welcome back to It's an Inside Job podcast. I'm your host, Jason Lim. Now, this podcast is dedicated to helping you to help yourself and others to become more mentally and emotionally resilient so you can be better at bouncing back from life's inevitable setbacks. Now, on It's an Inside Job, we decode the science and stories of resilience into practical advice, skills, and strategies that you can use to impact your life and those around you. Now, with that said, let's slip into the stream. Well, welcome back to the podcast on the top of a new week. I hope you've all had a relaxing and rejuvenating weekend. This week, I have a great episode lined up for you. This week, we're going to do a deep dive into the term psychological safety. Because when we look at resilience of teams, organizations, any group of people, psychological safety is at the core. It is fundamental. Without it, well, you don't have resilient teams, resilient organizations. Now, as you all know, I know a little about psychological safety, but I do not have the whole picture, far from it. And so I searched high and low for an expert, someone who's dedicated their career to the subject, to the topic of psychological safety, someone who's done research and has a lot of experience within that area. And so, and my diligence has paid off. So my guest today is Bord Fien. He's a PhD scholar at NHH, Norwegian School of Economics, and a former leader in the Norwegian Armed Forces. Bord's research focuses on psychological safety, which he defines as the shared belief within a team that is the safe to take interpersonal risks. He believes that this concept is essential for effective teamwork, and he's passionate about making research accessible and practical. In this episode, we dive into Board's background in the military and how it led him to study psychological safety. We discuss how his experience in leadership and development and operational service in the Norwegian Armed Forces helped shape his views. Board shares his insights on why psychological safety can be perceived differently within the same team and what factors contribute to these individual differences. We also touch upon his personal experience with safety at work, including discussions about hierarchies and the challenges facing the Norwegian Armed Forces. This conversation with Board was fascinating. We touched on so many different aspects of how psychological safety is embedded in so many parts of an organization, of a team, of individuals. You know, he brings his research and his studies and his years of experience in this field. And he speaks practically and pragmatically as to how we can use it and how we can apply it and how key it is to any team, whether in the private sector, the public sector, the military. So sit back, relax, and join me for an insightful conversation with Bord Fien about psychological safety, leadership, and so much more. I thought, Bord, maybe we could begin the conversation with you introducing who you are and what you do. For sure, Jason. Thanks for uh, having me. Good to be here. Um, yeah, my name is Bord. I'm a lucky uh, husband of uh, my wife, Tonya, and a lucky father of three kids, aged four to nine. So uh, that's uh, that's where I am uh, kept busy when I'm not at work. Other than that, I'm... Uh, I'm passionate about learning new stuff. I'm very curious. And that uh, curiosity has brought me now into uh, academia. So uh, that's where I'm uh, at work. I'm at the Norwegian School of Economics in Bergen, Norway, where I've been since uh, 2017, working on a PhD on uh, psychological safety. And uh, since I introduced with the the curiosity, uh, I have a quite practical background from the military which made me very curious about this topic. Uh, so, so I think that uh, describes me good as a person, since you ask who I am. Yeah, I, I think psychological safety is a front and center issue for many organizations, corporations, you know, schools, the, the whole gambit. And that's what I w- I'd like to kind of discuss with you, because I have a passion for psychological safety. I think maybe my my entrance into this whole subject is slightly different from you, but I think the passion for both of us overlaps. And that's why I wanted to have a, you know, a frank discussion about what it is and talked about the practicalities for our listeners and how maybe they can employ it for just lead themselves, but also lead mm-hmm. others if, if that may, if that is their role. 
maybe we could backtrack a little and talk about was it sort of your military career, as you said, that led you into the curiosity or the fascination of learning more about psychological safety? For sure. Yeah, it, it is. Because uh, I've, um, yeah, I, I worked with different stuff uh, during my, my career in the military, which was uh, about 15 uh, years uh, from where I started in 2002. Um, and uh, yeah, so, so I've had different jobs uh, working on different uh, kinds of things but but a common denominator was that i was part of many teams mm. i had i had to cooperate with you uh, even though i <laughs> even though i wanted to or not so all these tasks i barely had uh, work where i have just been been by myself so so this this trying to to get a corp a corporation between the two of us to to really function well uh, I've been dependent on that, and then I felt that works. Cooperating with other people, cooperating with you is great when that works, and and it's not that that great when it doesn't work. So I've been really fascinated by by what, why is that so? Because I'm the same board. I have my personality, uh, but but still my my behavior can be different working with you compared to working with someone else. I can feel that I really can contribute well in some settings, not in others. So, so that's that, that's where my my personal uh, curiosity for this this uh, topic came, and I, uh, that uh, whether a cooperation uh, between two people work well or not is not solely dependent on psychological safety. But when I was introduced to that term, I felt it just wow, yeah, that's that's something um, that's something that that hit me. Uh, at a personal level, that I then wanted to uh, to dig further into when entering academia. I was wondering, maybe we could just start with the fundamentals. How do you operationally define psychological safety? I um, I like to explain it as as the 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 room mm -hmm. where you perceive that it's okay to be yourself. And, but but it can't stop there because because mm. that's then when you're only at the individual uh, level. When I since my curiosity is for this cooperation again, when I then talk about psychological safety, it, it can be a challenge if if because if I'm allowed to be myself and you're allowed to be yourself, that can we may that we may face some challenges here because we may may be very different. So to me, psychological safety. Uh, in a in a cooperation setting, it's not only about the room that you're allowed to be yourself, but you're allowed to be yourself in um, in um, interaction with others, in collaboration with others, not on not in a way that it's on on behalf of others, because that that won't really make you may feel safe then, but then I may not feel safe. So so your safety may go on on behalf of mine, and and then then we're not really psychologically safe in, we or we don't we don't have a psychologically safe environment to feel safe in interaction with others. I guess that's that's a my at least my personal way of operationalizing to to operationalize it in that yeah. sense. I, I mm. because I I concur with much of what you say. Mm. For me. Because my background is from clinical psychology and a deep interest in neuroscience. And so when you look at the neurobiology of it, psychological safety, I mean, there's a whole pain network, you know, there's the social pain network and it's, it's linked to physical pain. And when people feel rejected or they feel disconnected to their team or to whatever group, that shows up as physical pain. And studies after studies show if you take an aspirin or a Pataset or something like that to deaden the pain, mm. the social pain actually disappears for the for a while. But once the aspirin or the, the the chemicals have sort of metabolized out of the blood system, what happens is that social pain comes back. So unless the underlying reasons why that disconnection are addressed, the social pain will come back, and it it actually comes back up as physical pain because. It's, what happens is we kind of, for what I see is that people literally when pain, you, you withdraw from pain, you quiet down. Or for some people who may be more extroverted, they may be more aggressive because they're trying to fight off the pain. That That's my perception. So I, mm -hmm. I, I, I concur with what you're saying. 
That's that's great. I, I love it. Uh, it's so great that you have this insight into the neuroscience because I, I don't know much about that, but I really want to learn more about that because I think that's important for us to really understand how this, uh, how our need for safety, uh, where, where that comes from to actually cooperate well with others, but also thrive uh, both at work and other uh, and at other um yeah, and in every aspect of life, really, because we need this safety at, at every aspect, even though me and others often study it at, at work. And in sort of a military setting, if we if we talked about a military organization, I mean, the military serves its purpose, and its purpose is sometimes is in the theater of conflict, where you will have a platoon or a group of people that have to maintain some sort of objective. And there can be very harsh conditions and i've spoken to a number of soldiers and be very harsh condition and they need to achieve an objective Hmm. how does psychological safety play in that because i think sometimes what i see is that people play too much into psychological safety and we have to take care of everyone's sensitivities but in in such a hostile demanding environment how does psychological safety play in that uh in those terms from your experience Hmm. A great question, and I, th- I think you, even though that that setting may be extreme for some, and 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 um, then maybe not that feel that relevant, it's still to me hopefully a good way to 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 explain um, uh, an, an important nuance here. Because um, Amy Edmondson and others who have, when they started uh, exploring psychological safety, it became kind of the opposite of of fear. And, and in, in some sense, it, it is, because uh, uh, then it was uh, in teams where there, where people were afraid to say what they had on their mind, uh, afraid to report mistakes. That, was, that, that is, in some sense, the opposite of feeling safe. Um, and that kind of fear, we need to address that. But still, we need the healthy kind of fear, which uh, I guess you, you know more about me uh, than from the neuroscience. But yeah, there, there, there is some, luckily, there is some, um, I have the ability to feel fear from the nature side. When, when that lion, I didn't just stand there, I, I went up that tree or something. Mm-hmm. So yeah, we need to feel that fear. And since you, you used the example of a hostile environment, when I was, I, I served in Afghanistan, if I didn't feel fear when I was going out on a mission, mm-hmm. I wouldn't probably be here, to to be frank. So we need that fear. Psychological safety should not be be the opposite of fear, uh, period. (laughs) We need that fear. But luckily, I've had uh, good colleagues that I felt safe around, where we could have these good conversations, honest conversations, where I could say that, okay, I I feel fear now. I am afraid. I, I don't really know how to handle this. And they could meet me with respect. So, so then, luckily, we had safety, and and under these these pressured conditions, we could also experience that. Yeah, all those hours we had spent training for this, it helps us being efficient in this setting. We can be uh, direct with each other without anyone feeling that this uh, oh no board doesn't like me no it's not about that he gives a direct order now because we need it we need to get the job done and we, and we can have safety enough for that uh, let's let's save the chit chat for other for, for later so so yeah safety plays out in 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 um, in, in different different ways but yeah. still so important mm. And I think that's also, you know, where you can, it sounds like in with you and your, your squad or your team or what have, however you characterize it, it sounds like the, you were allowed to have, and it was okay to have constructive conflict that you could have hard conversations without everyone thinking sensitive. And it's not like, oh, he doesn't like me or, but it's about dealing with the, the challenge at hand. Is that what I understand? Is that, is that part of it? It, for sure, a part of it, yes, and and that's that isn't that that is an important part of this psychological safety. Uh, it, it's not about a a cozy environment. Of course, it should be allowed to to have a cozy environment and, and just have, <laughs> have a relaxed feeling. But but we have yeah. some arenas where that works well, mm. and we have some arenas where that doesn't work. Where we where we need to be just candid uh, and and be frank with each other and say, hey, Jason. That's not good enough. I know you can do better. Come on now, uh, be direct. But but 
hopefully we have had enough time together to build a sense of uh, of, of um, uh, uh, benevolence uh, mm -hmm. where, where we really wish each other well uh, so that you know that when I've, I'm I'm direct with you here now, maybe it seem insensitive for, for your uh, feelings. I'm not. I do this because I care about you. And this is the arena where we, where we are direct with each other. And, and hopefully we still feel safe. That, that doesn't go on behalf of our safety. It is uh, a result mm. of our safety that makes us more efficient together in that setting. But but with that said, I don't believe we should go around doing that all day long, <laughs> because it can be be tiresome as well. Uh, luckily, we have uh, also in the military enough time to to sit down and and talk uh, <laughs> talk normal, uh, yeah, yeah. spend time listening for sure. Because because otherwise we won't we won't achieve that uh, high performance um, uh, mode, if you would call it that, under under the more extreme settings. Well, I guess what you're speaking to is, I, if I understand it correctly, is sort of a, a spectrum of interaction. Where's this socializing on one, where it's just kicking back and just talking as guys would talk or what have you, soldiers would talk, to in the planning room when you're planning the operation or the strategy or the execution of the mission, and then way over here, actually in the theater of conflict. So you have this sort of the, the small talk and the socializing talk in those relaxed environments. In the planning room, that is where you, the soldiers or those reporting to you can ask questions. They can try to understand what the, your intent is, what the situational awareness is, and understanding sort of what the impact is or why we're doing what we're doing and what the end game is. So in that environment, you allow for discussion, you allow for questions. Is that what I understand? Mm, for sure, and we're really dependent upon that. And this this uh, connects very well well with our, our leadership theory of, of a, mm. a mission based leadership, which Norway kind of have uh, signed up to, and I know, know a lot of other countries as well because the, the conflict uh, today is different than it, mm. when it yeah hundred years ago. The conflict is messy. We don't really know who is our enemy or not. Uh, we face uh, enemies or uh, opponents that mm -hmm. we don't necessarily wish us, wish us well or not, and, and they're not necessarily dressed in a uniform. So we need to always be able to adapt, to read a situation, make the best out of it. That's why we need a, a mission-based leadership where those at the spot are able uh, and feel free to make the best decisions at the spot, not just determined by by some general at a at a tent uh, way back there. So so, but for that to work, we need this. We need this safety. We need to build this safety in 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 peace in a peace setting, yes. where we have time to do that. We need to build uh, safety in that planning room where we can discuss, ask mm -hmm. questions, so that those going out there feel that okay, I have. Uh, I have my leaders in the back here. They're giving me this uh, opportunity because they trust me. Uh, and I, with that, I, I bring some safety into the really unsafe environment. And so this ability to adapt, this is what you speak to of is centralized command, decentralized control. Mm -hmm. So you guys understand what the objective is, but if comms went, if, if there was a blackout in communication somehow, you still understand what this squad's purpose was and what the objective is and what the end game is. This, that's what I understand when you're saying adapting and evolving to a situation. Yeah. Yeah. Jason, that's, uh, that's, that's right. Um, and, and of course that, that's what we work towards, but as, as everything else, it's always easier said than done, but that's what we, we train and, and work towards. Yes. Because we're always put, put us simply the, the, those who win the world are those who are able to adapt the quickest mm -hmm. in 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 a messy world and, and i guess uh, or i think that aligns with mm -hmm. with uh, with all, all settings that are are um, determined by uncertainty so so this even though yeah these examples may be a bit extreme and uh, for for uh, many I, I for sure understand that but hopefully most people see that okay this aligns with what we're doing as well we as a company we're in very uh, volatile and certain settings here. Yeah, we call it the VUCA environments. Uh, just a strange word for that. The world is uncertain. Uh, uh, acronym for that, but that that has impact on our 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 need for efficient cooperation, efficient mm -hmm. leadership, and and then we need this this safety uh, within to face that uncertainty on the outside. 
I, I would say that it is a precondition to actually function in that, because I, if I'm both facing that uncertainty out there, and I, I'm also uncertain that Jason uh, wished me well as my colleague or my leader, I, I don't have much energy left to to <laughs> to solve my task really. And I, I think it, that speaks to the investment that is needed to create those social bonds, to create that connective tissue between team members. Yeah. So if we come back to the spectrum, you spoke to, you know, there, it's important to socialize and small talk and connect on that sort of relaxed level. Then you have the planning room yeah. where you're, you're planning the operations. And this is where people can ask questions and they can, to, to get clarity, to understand what yeah. it is, to, to share feedback. But then if we move to the extreme, when you're out in the theater of combat, then obviously psychological safety is so important there, but the elements in the planning room are not always going to be there. I guess there's different elements of psychological safety that have to play because there you need to give a command and they can't constantly question your command if you, you're moving into something. Now, I know this is an extreme thing when we're talking about organizing corporations, but sometimes in the extreme, we can, it gives us context to learn what we are doing. Mm -hmm. In that theater of combat, when you were leading the soldiers into whatever mission, how does psychological safety show up there that's slightly different from planning, or is it basically the same fundamental elements? I, I would say that it's the, the same basic elements that we've, we we build this safe in, in peacetime. Uh, I don't know how that, if that translates well into English, but, mm -hmm. but, but that's the kind of a, a term we use in, we used in, in the military, you know, mm -hmm. that we, what we do in, in when it's peaceful, that's, that's what we bring out with us when it's uh, not that peaceful. So, so let's use this time well, and let's use it to build, to build safety. We need to use it connecting with each other, building those relationships uh, and and making and, and clarifying as as you point out, which is very much important. So so both the relational part is important for the safety, but also the the clarity part. So I know what is expected of me. That is important for me to to feel safe, and that is not a contradicting a trust based or a mission based leadership uh, thought. It is a it is a precondition for that. So you know, yeah, I, I, I guess the 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 extreme examples for sure. Um, the, the safety may may look differently. But still, it's the same. It is the same that I, I know that, okay, the person to the right of me wished me well. He's going to do whatever he can to to help me do my work, to make me, um, and, and I'm going to do the same for, for that person. Yeah. So, so yeah, I don't know if I, I answered the question well, but, but um, I, yeah. I think you did because, I mean, what it sounds like is that it's in the more relaxed states, whether it's relaxing or planning, where the connective tissue of trust, the transparency, credibility, uh, security, connectedness, value is all established. And so in those extreme situations, the trust is already there. You can fall back on it. You don't have to think about it. It's a, it's a natural part of the DNA of that team. And so when they're facing crisis, they can depend upon each other. I, I think that's what I, I, it sounds like I'm hearing from you. Oh, yeah, yeah, you, you're good at uh, translating it into <laughs> in a good way, Jason. So thanks for that. Um, and, and a term uh, w w that we used uh, in, in other settings, but uh, or not necessarily speaking about psychological safety, but I think that is highly relevant here as well. It's that we don't we don't rise to the occasion; we rise to the level of training. And well psychological said. safety is also yeah. something that we 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 train that 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 we we work on which also leads to my my own research i haven't done my research in this setting uh I'm doing it in more quite more <laughs> a lot more peaceful settings <laughs> but but where we also where also see that uh this is a this is a building safety is an investment that we do we do every day so the training we do every day at work if that comes to yeah building the competence in that field or that uh, for sure we need to do that as well but building safety i also view that as a as, as a training exercise that we don't we will never get done uh, and we may lose it you know if I stop working out I, I will lose my strength also and yeah in a sense I will lose I, or I, I don't say that will happen but we may lose our safety as well when we stop focusing on it uh, investing in those relationships stop clarifying uh, uh, stuff with each other I, we, we may lose out on that safety and that 
may lead to to less uh, or worse. Uh, let's call it performance in the setting uh, when we're uh, when we're supposed to perform, if that is in war or in in uh, business life or any other place. I think that's so well said. You know, I it resonates with me what you're saying, Board, because psychological safety for me is not a static place. You're either climbing or you're sliding. Mm-hmm. And so it's a constant work in progress. And as you said, you know, to keep up your endurance, your flexibility, your mobility, your strength, what have you, you need to constantly train each of those for physically. But I think psychologically, when you're talking about that connective tissue between team members, that is so such a salient point. So when you you were speaking about training every day, I mean, what specific behaviors or communication strategies can enhance psychological safety from if we move from the military to sort of organizations, day to day organizations, what is needed amongst the team members? That have uh, what what I've seen from from the teams that I follow that have built built safety. Uh, over time, because that has been kind of my my uh, take on it. Uh, mm-hmm. When I first saw that, yeah, this safety is quite a, it's quite perishable. You know, we we may we may, lo- may may lose it, even though we had it. It's not like we 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 just become safer just being around each other. Mm-hmm. I, I, f- I follow teams that have become less safe. Uh, actually over time so so being able to study these teams in different settings over time some of the the common uh, denominators for those teams that have have actually built safety over time is is uh, we've already covered some of those things but they're they're focused on on connecting with each other in in all different in all the settings that I've been in everybody talks about I need to know the others for some that is about friendship uh, especially about younger um uh, among students and, yes. and in, in firms where we're, uh, yeah, uh, younger generation. I sound so old when I say that, <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but yeah, for sure. Let's, yeah. we need to take that as mm. seriously as, as, uh, mm. as organizations as well. That, that is, that is an expectancy for some, um, for others, they don't talk about friendship, but, but all, everybody talk about this. Yeah. Yeah. I need to know about, know the others. That's often the first thing people tell me. So those teams that actually build this safety over time uh, and, and, and a more robust safety that actually can grow over time, uh, they, keep, they continue investing in each other, in, in, in each other's relationships, getting to know each other, showing curiosity, uh, interest in each other. So, so that is the the relational part, and the yeah. other uh, another important part is the is the clarity part that we've uh, also covered a bit. They they don't only is like start out uh, when working as a team. What is important? What is our goal? I, I mm. hope that is that is something I advise any team to do. To to uh, um, I have some colleagues here who have studied the the uh, startup phase of teams and yeah. built this this kind of tool that they call Start Smart, which is very important. The things we do in the beginning is very important. But what I say, yeah, we need to start smart, but we need also to continue smart because we may still lose this clarity if that's just something we did when we made a team charter or something. These teams that build safety over time, they keep focusing on, okay, are, are everybody still on board here? Uh, have I actually informed Jason about what I I found out here? This 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 view on on yeah I, I can't just keep this these things for myself. I need to share it. I need to make a good um, uh, talk about expectations. So we have a, a clarity, a role clarity, and and a clear expectations with each other. So the both the relational part and the 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 part that. Um, that talks part. about uh, clarity and, and the predict- pr- providing some sense of predictability is, is a key word for me there as well. Clarity may, may give us some predictability, uh, mm-hmm. which becomes even more important when, when the surroundings are very unpredictable. I think that's so well said. For me, you know, uh, we were talking just sort of pre-interview here mm-hmm. that I used to work with, with trauma and one of the major things is for psychological safety at that level to create social reward. People needed to feel secure. They needed to feel connected and they needed to be feel valued. And it doesn't always have to be trauma, but I mean, that's for, as you said, it's almost every sentence. Your, your experience in the military can be applied to the university or to the boardroom or to the meeting room or to the, around the family sitting around a table or a sports team. So I, I agree with you in so many aspects and that predictability, that sense of certainty, that creates a sense of stability for people. 
you know, that feeling secure. So that's so well said. And I think also what you were referring to is, is also the sense of autonomy, where it's not yeah. micromanaging that I feel that I can trust my people, I delegate to them, I let them run, I might tell them the what and why of what we need, but how of implementation, well, I'll leave that to them because I've trusted them. But as you said, it's a work in progress. It's something you have to constantly come back to. But to to build that trust, that sense of credibility or the autonomy, it takes time. It's not a snap of the fingers. It's more like a dimmer switch. You slowly have to turn up the light. Is that what I understand you're saying? For sure, yeah. And it, it, it does it is an investment that that um, can pay off over time. But but uh, yeah, as other investments as well, uh, in a short run, yeah, we, we we may we may lose some of this this investment as well. Uh, so so it may may drop. But over time, uh, these are at least some of the the things I I, I see that teams are that actually build safety uh, over time are are focused on. And and another thing um, is the because uh, there are a lot of studies showing the the importance of uh, psychological safety for for team performance. But when I've studied this this safety, and I don't contradict that, I would just want to add to that. Because when mm. I've studied psychological safety over time, I see that the the arrow also goes the other way. You know, okay, so safety the safe arrow goes from safety to performance in a team, but the arrow also goes from performance to safety, which means that for some of these teams, mm. or the, the reason I say that, for some of these teams, is it was first when they where it started. Show, having some results that they can see, wow, we've actually achieved something. That's when they started feeling safe. Okay, so so they did some of this relational part, they did some mm. of this clarity part, but they still didn't know. But but are we actually achieving something? Is it is it worth the time? Is it worth the effort being here? It was when I saw that. Okay, I actually contribute to this team, and this team is achieving something. We're performing. That's that has had a great impact on their safety. Now I can't just decide that uh, that uh, that we perform because that takes a lot of work and work over time. But what I can do is being aware of of how we face and talk about our achievements. Do we all, do we only focus on our mistakes, which we should focus on because hopefully we can learn from them? Mm-hmm. But do we actually talk about the things that are going well? Um, so, so I guess this this uh, resonates with the you know, celebrate your uh, uh, wins. Let's allow to, allow ourselves to do that. And, and in the Norwegian culture, maybe mm. in uh, Scandinavia as well, we could talk about this uh, this uh, jant uh, love, mm. which uh, which can be quite uh, probably have some good things with it, but a lot of bad things too as well. When, when speaking of this, you're not always allowed to be say yes, I did a good job. I'm satisfied. This was great. Well, maybe we, as, at least as a team, should do a little bit more of that because I see that that's important for the safety we feel. So, so yeah, maybe be aware that we don't do that too much. Uh, like at, at the individual level, that comes on behalf of others, and like taking the honor for what others have done because that probably won't make much safety. But performing <laughs> no, as a team no. yeah. and, and focusing mm-hmm. on that, yes, great job, mm-hmm. Jason. We did this together. Let's end the week by doing that. Uh, maybe we'll feel a bit safer when we come back on Monday. I really like that because you said, you know, a lot of times we focus on psychological safety in order to create great performance. But what you're saying, we can also reverse performance to get down to psychological safety. Yeah. If I've heard you correctly, is that, you know, there's that doubt, are we actually developing something? But once some sort of measurable or quantitative uh, goal is being achieved, that becomes um, a feedback loop giving us confirmation and that in itself what i understand from what you're saying that can boost psychological safety because that's a concrete quantitative tangible marker that we have what that what we're doing is actually having effect is that what i understand Mm, for sure jason Hmm. and i must say you're you're great at reading back you know it's (laughs) because in my uh my uh translating from Norwegian to English here and hoping it makes sense. It's just so great that you read back. It makes me feel safer, Jason. You're a good example of building safety in communication because then I, yes, I'm, he reads me the way I wanted him to read me. That's, <laughs> I just wanted to say, it's, it's great. Cheers, Porta. Yeah. I appreciate the feedback. Thank you very much. 
At the top of the conversation, Ward and I talked about how psychological safety shows up in the military from his experiences in Afghanistan, from the planning room where people feel that they can get clarity, where they can ask questions to understand the mission and to question the results of the mission and what they're trying to achieve. But then out into the field of combat in the theater and how psychological safety shows up, where you can trust people based on the clarity of the mission and the relationship. Now, that those are extremes, but through the extremes, that allows us to give us context in the teams, the organizations, the companies that in which we work. Now, Borg talked about VUCA. Well, VUCA is an acronym that stands for volatility, uncertainty, complexity, and ambiguity. It's often used to describe the current business and economic environment, which is characterized by rapid change, unpredictability, and the need to adapt quickly to new situations. Now, this comps at VUCA originated in the military to describe the challenges faced by soldiers in modern warfare, but it has been since adopted by business leaders to describe the complexity and unpredictability of the modern business environment. The term is used to describe the need for leaders and organizations to be flexible, adaptable, and innovative in the face of these challenges. And at the heart of it, Ford says, well, that's psychological safety. There's no getting around it. And as Ford said, we don't rise to the occasion, we rise to the level of training. So let's slip back into the stream and continue my conversation with Ford. The p- pandemic, for a lot of the bad things, it, it also gave us a lot of good things. But one of the things it does, we had to retreat behind walls. Now I'm speaking the obvious here, and we had to go to remote or virtual meetings and connecting with each other. And that can be, uh, for many, as I've understood from my clients, that became very transactional because they were just racing from one Zoom meeting or team meeting to the next. I'd just like to have your opinion. Can psychological safety be built into virtual or remote work environments? And if so, how can we do this? It's, it's a great question and, and, and very important, even though we hope that we're done with this uh, corona and everything. Yeah, we, yeah, please, the, yeah, the remote work, the, mm. the hybrid workplace, these these discussions will... Mm. Yeah, or m- many organizations are, are, are in the midst of this. Uh, mm. So let's look a little bit about what we learned from, from this period when it came to the, the digital uh, cooperation, virtual mm. cooperation. Uh, and for some of the teams, because I was studying teams when this hit us in some years back, and I yeah, I wondered about this. How how would this affect the safety? And in some teams, it, it didn't really affect them much. Mm-hmm. But in those teams, they, they already had had the time to to become a team, to include each other's. So so when when those teams actually had uh, some some something in place, <laughs> they they could con- continue working on this safety. And and yeah, they could. Uh, I saw some of the same uh, changes over time that some some lost it, but it wasn't necessarily due to to uh, to working digitally or, or or not. Actually, for some, they they said that uh, they became a bit more uh, safe around each other because now they could look into each other's homes, which they had never done before. So I saw your background there, and I saw your kids uh, arguing or uh, almost killing each other. And my kids are doing the, the same. Yeah, yeah. So it kind of it kind of helped some of us to lower our uh, lower the bar a little bit and show a bit more of ourselves. So that was kind of an maybe a little bit un- unexpected positive result. Some things we did see what was uh, challenging that we should uh, take bring with us when planning on this uh, further is that uh, for, for a lot of people, building new uh, relationships was very hard on teams uh, or digitally. So uh, when I talked to people, I interview people who hadn't, they had been a half a year, a year at their new job, but they had still hadn't met their their colleagues face to face. It's really strange to to think back of, but as we could guess, uh, the safety for those people were, was quite low. So including others, building a new team uh, digitally uh, seemed hard for many. And another important uh, thing um, was that we tend to communicate more with the people that we are already safest among. So if you and I kind of already have this this little uh, subgroup of ours in this team, we communicate even more when we're on, uh, doing it digitally than 
and when we're in the, that boardroom or meeting room, because um, then then we're not allowed to the same degree to just have our thing here. Mm. Subgrouping is something that I, I advise everyone to be really aware of. Uh, that I've seen also outside the the uh, this digital teamwork uh, aspect that can be quite detrimental for psychological safety. That there is this click in a team where there's there's we and the we're the we're the smart ones. We're the ones that have been there the longest. Uh, we're the guys. Or, or yes, or some other reason that we used to kind of carry or, or grab a little extra position, a little extra power influence that is oh, sure great for us but that's not that great for the others who feel on the outside if if we're then going digitally we seem that these these subgroups could even be strengthened because we tend to communicate even more with those we are already closest to and even less with the others in the team and which could weaken the team as a whole so that was some of the the, the probably a couple of the most important things that that uh, we we saw through the team research uh, during the the corona years. It was interesting is when you were talking about subgroups because as you were doing it, my brain was kind of trying to connect uh, other other ideas. And when you said about subgroups, you know, it's like sometimes I've been to parties, you know, and as a Canadian walking into you know a party with, with a number of Norwegians, I might know one or two. But I will tend to gravitate to those people that I know, start there. But you can see these sort of clicks forming. And as the night goes on, then then they more meld together. But for me, it, it's almost an, an analogous to what you're speaking about when you have these sort of subgroups. And they can be enhanced virtually because it also brings up, when you're talking about these subgroups, I mean, it can show up in different forms. I, I wrote a piece on proximity bias is that where we tend to favor those closer to us than those further for us. And what I mean in this context is a lot of meetings now can be sort of a mix of virtual and in-house where people are actually present in the room and there's some people on 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 zoom or teams but proximity bias is a, t- a it's a kind of bias where we will favor those in the room and we will kind of communicate with those face to face and unintentionally we may ignore through our body language those on the screen i was wondering i don't know if your research or from your own personal experience how can we bring down this proximity bias and try to be inclusive to both people who are connecting virtually and those in real life IRL. I haven't that much experience myself, but Mm. that that is a, that is a question and a a discussion I've had several times with others Mm. because they have these, these hybrid meetings, someone at the screen and someone Mm. uh, uh, in in place uh, face to face. And, And their experience is that that doesn't work well. So I doesn't say that that's for everyone, but but at least that's my impression from talking to people in different mm-hmm. firms. That most of these have experienced that it, it's better than to to get everybody on screen because it's so much easier for for you and I to just be that are situated in this meeting room to to dominate this talk. It's harder for that people those people who are kind of to have to raise their digital mm-hmm. hand to to get their word out there they don't they can't read the the atmosphere in the room so so it's harder for them to to jump in there it it raises the bar for them to interact with us so so what a lot of people have have uh, landed on as a, as a solution is to okay if someone is on screen uh, everybody is on screen mm-hmm. Uh, so, so I guess that's. Um, so I haven't done research on exactly on that. Now I talk more of my experience. my experience talking yeah, yeah. to to people around that. Mm. But I, I think that's that's really good advice. I mean, it's 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 straight, it's simple, and it it has an effect, as you said, psychologically for people. If everyone's on the screen, then you know it's an equal basis, and this whole idea of proximity bias it just it just dissipates, it evaporates. It's not an issue. So if if it needs to be a blended meeting, don't have a blended meeting. That sounds like sound advice to me. Yeah, and, and it's um, yeah. Again, even though I haven't kind of researched that or studied that specifically, it, it still resonates with my my finding of these subgroups because because a subgroup can be due to many things, uh, and and a subgroup may for sure emerge by some people just being or being located at the same spot with some others just spread out and and 
I guess it can make it even more challenging if that becomes a pattern. You know that you, the you, you, two of us, we we always because we live right by work. You know, so we always come to yeah. work and and really get safer around around each other. And our colleague who who lives further uh, by and have uh, three kids who are often sick and have to stay at home, it becomes yeah. more and more distant, uh, less and less safe to to uh, yeah be honest with us and and. Um, and then interact, contribute the way he or she actually could have some things there. I would advise advise everyone to to be aware of. With that said, working digitally does not have to be to have to destroy our safety in any way. I've I've seen a lot of really safe teams uh, working on teams, uh, and that worked quite well. So, but then th- these teams are are they're focused on again these these same things that we have been talking about that they everybody is on board. Uh, we still try to invest in each other, even though it can be a bit more seem a bit more like uh, I don't know artificial or yes. uh, that that we have to take this digital coffee break. Mm-hmm. But yeah, let's still do it. You know, let's let's still hang out that digital coffee mm-hmm. machine or water mm-hmm. cooler, uh, just to show that we we want everyone to bo- be on board, and and we don't allow uh, people in a meeting to be uh, behind a black screen, even though that can be comfortable for some. But mm-hmm. we don't ma- want to make it uncomfortable for you. We just want you to be here because that is important, and if that is how we do it we see each other, we, we more likely will build a, a safe environment where everybody feels seen. Because a lot of the things we're, we're talking about here is, is about that, you know, that, that need in us. We all need to feel seen uh, by, our, by everyone. Uh, and, and that's probably where, where I learn a lot about psychological safety from my kids as well. To be a, to be a bit personal with you here. I hope that's okay. No, no, I, I've they, got three kids myself, yeah. so I'm in the same boat as you. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I can read a lot about psychological safety and leadership and teams, and but, <laughs> yeah, I tend to often learn most about these things from my from my um, kids who who just demonstrate that they need my attention. They recognize very quickly if I if they don't have my attention, mm-hmm. just my fake attention, uh, and they let me know, um, and and they put in words that I I need to be seen in in different ways. I remember this this one time that came up to my uh, uh, mind here the other day um, when when I delivered my my child, he was uh, then three years old in the in the kindergarten, and it was a busy morning. All uh, parents for small kids know about these mornings, you know, already too late and I have an appointment, I'm going to teach and I have students waiting, come on. I hope this isn't the morning where there's trouble in the kindergarten, <laughs> you know, focusing on myself. Yeah, uh, yeah. Me, it's about me this morning, you know, so here in my little son, get in there, pushing him a little bit, maybe. Okay, I sound like a bad dad now, but I admit that I was focusing on myself that morning. But this morning, uh, none of the the workers at the kindergarten came came out in the the hall for, for probably some good reason. Mm-hmm. But 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 I, I didn't really think about that. So I was like, okay, here you go, uh, son. See you in the afternoon, and I'm about to leave. And then I I still f- felt his his arm around my foot, and and he said, but dad, nobody has seen me. And I was like, oh, then and then, there and then, you know, the world just stopped and the students could be students and the appointment could be an appointment because, yeah, you're right. Uh, I was a bit embarrassed that I only kind of focused on myself, but luckily I was able to adapt to the situation and see that you're right. Nobody has come to see you. And, and that is, your, your, your day depends on that. That you're seen by the people around you. Uh, so luckily, I stayed there for a while, and we uh, sold that, and the and the the people working there came out and and saw him. Um, so he was uh, he he felt safe, and I still remembered sitting on the in the car afterwards that, you know, this this stuff about psychological psychological safety at work, it's about the same things. 
we need to feel seen from the people around us. Uh, I meet people who, who come and go to, and interview people who come and go to work without people noticing, without people saying hi or goodbye. That story you told, I mean, that was just the core to everything. I mean, you could read textbooks, but that moment crystallized how important that connectivity, that that sense of being seen. I, th I think it was such a salient story that it really hits home how important. I mean, we could talk all the theory, but that moment in that uh, kindergarten with your son, dad, I haven't been seen. You know, that just, that just kind of, that was a wake up call for yourself. I think it would be a wake up for, call for any of us. Yeah. I remember a story since we're talking about this. Yeah. I, I'm, my kids are a little older now. They're in their teens, but this was about 10 years ago. I have twin girls and a boy who's just about a couple of years older. And my girls were uh, about five at that time. So one of the twins and, and their brother were out in the garden playing and I, it was after it was after picking them up from school and such. And I was making dinner and I was lost in my own head, like yourself. And one of my girls, Erica, she he, she pulls on my pant leg and says, "Daddy, Daddy, I'm going out to play." Okay, Daddy, Daddy, I'm gonna. And she kept pulling on my leg, Daddy, Daddy, I'm going out to. Play. Okay, okay. And I'm just over the oven, right? Daddy, Daddy, I want to go out and play. Okay, go. But then it kicked into me, bored. And I thought, oh, I got down, I, I bent down, so I was eye level with her. So she was seen. And I said, okay, Erica, I heard what you're saying. You want to go out and play with Lucas and Katya? Go out, go out and play with them. I'll call you in when dinner's ready. Boom, she was gone. Yeah. You know, <laughs> so it, it yeah. Really, it, you, your story kind of tugged on my heartstrings there because I've, I've felt, well, not just once, numerous times where I've been kind of lost in my own space. I, uh, well, then, uh, yeah, and I can for sure... Uh, Understand your your yeah, your your setting and story there as well. Uh, often very focused on ourselves, uh, and and uh, luckily we have children that sometimes can can direct us and and teach us the importance of this. It's good if those those experiences we if we can bring them into work, uh, to be those uh, people at work who actually contribute to the safety of those around us, making sure that that our colleagues feel seen. It takes such little from us to to just show those people that little attention but often we think that we are too busy to do it or something and but those those little moments in the long run speaking of safety as a perishable a good or, or, or something that we need to keep investing in yeah those small investments in our work environment is is um makes all the difference really makes make, make all the difference yeah you were talking about where, you know, during the pandemic, some people would have joined the team, but they never actually physically met their colleagues. And so it became very relevant for a lot of organizations to think about their their onboarding of new people. You know, because sometimes what I've seen is that, you know, a corporation will bring someone in, they'll say, okay, here's your desk, here's your computer, here's all your equipment, your paraphernalia, or what have you. Please get to work and we'll see you at lunch. Considering the pandemic, considering all of what we've spoken about today, what is your recommendation when it comes to onboarding new new people to a team, to a corporation? What should be included? What should leaders or organizations think about when they're bringing people into a whole new environment with new colleagues and such? Mm. Oh, that's a great, uh, great question. And um, I, I guess I would... would uh emphasize uh, emphasize those things that, that that we have been talking about but but really putting them into system to make sure that that from day on our colleagues are, and especially our, then our new colleagues do feel seen do feel appreciated uh, so so we're from the beginning focused on on helping these and investing in these these new colleagues helping them feel uh, in place that this is a good place for me to be this is a place where I can belong, uh, which is uh, a core need in, in all of us. But we also contribute to this clarity that we've been talking about, that we also early on uh, help people in a, in a well-meant and good uh, way, help people to understand what is expected of them so that, that, um, that they, don't, they don't have to go around and, and worry about that. Um, I, I think, because I haven't studied 
onboarding uh, myself. Uh, so now I'm just trying to uh, kind of adapt other things that I've, I've uh, started in, into this. But I have I, I did re- read a study on on this that I found quite interesting. That the the safety among um, newcomers was was uh, fairly uh, fairly low, but <clears throat> kind of kept growing. When they they felt uh, invested in when when they when there was some onboarding program, but then after a while when there kind of was wasn't really a part of this onboarding uh, program anymore, uh, the safety dropped. So so I guess that's something uh, that kind of struck me as well. I haven't I haven't worked on onboarding programs no, no, or no. I haven't worked mm. with HR, but but that kind of made me think. Yeah, that should be a, a wake up call to many as well. Uh, that yeah. Uh, for sure, the first day, the first week is maybe it's the most important week. But yeah, week two and three and so on are they're quite important as well. If people come here and they get used to everybody saying hi and they get a cake and a flower and a number ba- or a, a badge on their door, and that's I think all those things are important. But 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 who's who's going to be there on on uh, on that uh, sad Monday morning in week five? Uh, where I'm suddenly not a exciting new colleague anymore. So 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 let's not only talk about the onboarding as as you know the the first day first week kind of thing. Let's talk about onboarding in light of these things that we've been talking about psychological safety as a continuous uh, investment that we need to to keep uh, keep working on. Um, yeah, just wanted to share that. Yeah, yeah, but I think that's great because when I'm in and out of corporations every week, every day, I think what's important to transition from the newbie, the new kid on the block, and then you've become part of the background noise of that corporation, you 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 become part of that corporation or organization or team, is to create a feedback culture where there is that, whether it's informal or formal feedback, where there is one-to-ones where you're not just always talking about the business, but you're talking about the relationship, how the communication, the collaboration, the cooperation. And if that becomes part of part and parcel of how this team interacts, I think then that may be to go to some, to some distance to help bridge that onboarding to being boarded as as you said, it, it can become from the strategic meeting or as you were with your soldiers resting and relaxing till, okay, there's a crisis meeting with a project, it's falling behind, costs are overrun, you know, the whole spectrum. And it's just to involve, to ask for opinions, to feel valued and such. So I think a lot of what you said, it really highlights that psychological safety is so fundamental at all different areas of an interaction within, you know, a group of people. I think that that was really, I really liked what you were saying about that. Thanks. One of the things that the pandemic taught many of us, and that was when we had to retreat behind our own walls and interact with friends and family and colleagues through a screen, it made it so apparent how we took things for granted, that face-to-face interaction. But over the last couple of years, because of the pandemic, it has taught us to adapt to blended meetings, where some of our meetings will be virtual and some of them will be IRL in real life. In the second part, Board talked about how subgroups can form. And that is we tend to communicate more often with people we know. Now, this happens in face-to-face environments, but also virtual environments. But it's in the virtual environments where this subgrouping becomes even more pronounced. And of course, this conversation led to the idea of proximity bias, where we favor those in the room rather than those on screen. And again, this is unintentional, but it also speaks to how we onboard new people, how we bring new people into the fold as part of the team. I mean, if companies and teams can develop great onboarding systems, people will feel psychologically safe from the get-go. But it's also how to continue that. So, you know, when they are no longer the new person, but they are part of the team, well, how do we continue that? Well, as Board said, the heart of it all comes down to, are we seen? Are we valued? Are we connected? And that comes back down to having regular feedback culture, regular one-to-ones to to clarify expectations. And at the end of the day, as Board says, psychological safety comes down to two major things, 
developing strong relationships, and developing clarity in communication. So let us now slip back into the stream for the final part of my fascinating conversation with Board Fiend. What other aspects from your research haven't we touched on that would be you know, relevant or very interesting for our listeners here today? One important aspect of this psychological safety that I've uh, I've seen through my work is the how different this safety can be uh, perceived within the same team. Because um, a lot of the the research on psychological safety um, is is within the team context uh, for good reasons because because this safety can be uh, unique for this team and it can be quite different when I enter a, a team meeting in a, in a different team later in that day. So, so there is for sure an important team aspect here, but I see that if, if we make then team cycle or psychological safety as, as a team phenomena period, we, we lose out on uh, something important here. Cause I quite early on in my, the teams I followed uh, saw that, yeah, that, that Jason feels safe doesn't really mean apparently that board feels safe because because Jason scores seven on this uh, psychological safety scale and board scores one and they're part of the same team. What's what's up? What's up here? So I was early on fascinated by that and I saw that most studies only took the the average. So psychological safety is a perception within a, a team and then we just take the average of the team and then this team has a safety of uh, five point uh, something which tells a lot about the safety of that team. It's still something else than if that would be two point something when everybody has scored in this scale uh, from, from one to seven typically. But uh, it doesn't say anything about the individual differences and I've seen that in in as good as all the teams that I've studied, and then also uh, gotten data and, and collaborated with other researchers who had bigger data sets, uh, seen that in most teams, most teams have one or more team member who perceive the safety to be quite different, significant, significantly different, to put it in, in a methodologically uh, word, um, than the rest of the team. So it is a team phenomena, but it's it's so much more than that. And that's not only of interest for researchers who mm. should be aware of just looking beyond the, the, the average, but we also see that that has a practical implication, mm. whether all team members actually feel safe. So, so going beyond the, not only the average, but also the, yeah, the standard deviation, how, how mm. the, the range from the safe to the to the most safe in the team also has an impact on how well this safety transfers into team effectiveness, team performance, how well these teams mm. function. So that individual difference, is it due to personality? Is it to, due to certain character traits? I mean, what do you think it is from your experience? I've... Um, uh, I have studied that as well because I, I early on thought because I also often face the question: this this safety isn't it mostly about personality? So I, I gathered a lot of data on that. Mm -hmm. uh, students here at the school, but but looking at more than more than a thousand uh, 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 participants, mm -hmm. I, I can't find connection between what I used the the Big Five uh, personality test then those those factors and the safety these students felt in their teams. So that doesn't mean that personality doesn't matter, mm -hmm. uh, but at least these tests, there, there's something with our, there's some individual differences that those those tests aren't able to draw out that is of more importance for the safety. So so for me, that's a super interesting uh, uh, that's fascinating, question that, that I want yeah, to yeah. dig further into because, and, and maybe you you have some, some thoughts on that as well, because I, I, since I... Already I said that, yeah, there are some individual differences here. And then I then say, but it's not about the personality or at least something that the personality test can show us. What is it about then? Is it about the the robustness of people? Is it about their, their experience from previous uh, conflicts, disagreements, uh, whether... I grew up in a family where disagreements was welcomed or something that we shouldn't talk highly about. I, I don't know. Now I'm just talking freely here, but th there is something there, but I'm still curious on, on what is, what is those individual differences then? Uh, 
uh, apparently they're they're not they're not about just being introvert or extrovert or or those things yeah. that that we often too too easily I would say tend to explain a lot of things with. And we can. Do you, do you have any t- take on that, Jason? Yeah. Well, again, it's just experience. <laughs> but let, let me try to. I'll try to riff on what you've just said. So, hmm. for me, I'm in and out of corporations. You know, even though my background's in clinical psychology, I do now work as a communication coach or a sparring partner. Hmm. And so, everyone is individual. I'm speaking the obvious here, but what I find is that I think is what you just said, Board. It's people's experiences. But it's the narrative they wrap around that experience or their chain of experiences. And so when I'm trying to help someone to develop or learn or move forward with something, I always ask, what's their story behind it? What's the meaning they've given to the situation? I think, as you said, it's too easy to say, oh, he's introverted, she's extroverted, and then that's what it is. Because I, I think it's too simplistic, it's too black and white. There's so much nuance between those two polar extremes. So when I used to work with trauma, every every trauma is different, and it's different levels, and, there's, and it affects people in different ways. What I was trained for was to try to help people make sense of what happened it's not to say what if, what if, because that just loses people. So what I tried to do and how I aided and helped people was to get them to speak about the trauma to the extent they would, and we would take different ways. And so what I saw that people who were able to move on, they found a sense of what we used to call psychological soundness, a sense of stability, because they made sense of the story. They understood that they were no longer a victim, but a victor. But what they did was they they changed the meaning, they changed the story, the narrative of what it was, and it became one of those, you know, a string. If you look at life as a string of pearls, it's just one pearl there, and it's just part of it. It's the that trauma did not define them. It was just part of their story. Those who couldn't move on or who those who, let's say, felt psychologically unsafe, they didn't make sense of it. They stayed in victim mode, not because they chose to, but they found it so hard to move on. And it's not to judge anyone, but that's what I find. And so if we move it to present day, I don't work with trauma anymore. I haven't worked for over 20 years but, you know, people face their challenges every day. And sometimes to understand what psychological safety is, is to understand their particular narrative. And then seeing how they see it, I have to ask a lot of questions to figure out how they perceive things. So it comes down to being seen and listening. But once I have a general picture and I check it with them, is this what you're saying? They go, yes. And so then, then I start try using reframing techniques to make them feel more psychologically safe. The, because it, as you said, psychologically safe is a very nuanced um, platform. And maybe one of the legs that holding that platform is a little weak. It's not everything. Maybe it's one thing. So we dive into there and we try to solidify that. And for me, again, this is just from my experience. I don't speak. This is anecdotal. It's to help them figure out, okay, so it's, you don't feel valued, just use that. How can we, how can we change that? What can you do about that? And when I ask them what they can do about it, it gives them a sense of autonomy that they can choose what to do. It gives them a sense of certainty. And we talk about things they can do, something concrete, tangible, quantifiable, but it's also effort-based where they can invest their actions. So they take back control and they can do something. It's not always worried about the outcome. But let's focus on now to move towards the outcome because then I feel that's where the confidence and when I can give them a sense of self-efficacy, self-efficacy just to define for any listeners who don't understand is the ability to take control over one situation. Mm -hmm. That's a long story, but that's my take on such a profound question that you've asked. That is super interesting, uh, Jason. Yeah, I I would love to... uh... Learn more about this. Uh, I, I really believe on in in, uh, in in what you say and the importance mm. of working on those those narratives. What I what I tell myself, which we all which all of us need to 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 focus on, uh, I believe, and and that that's something I've uh, I'm, I'm also it's such a, so important for me to to communicate that this when when we're talking about this psychological safety, it's it's something we all need to need to talk about, not because. 
it's not because there's something wrong with our team. It's not because we have conflicts or, or something, but just because we are human beings with a need to feel safe. We need to belong. Uh, and for us to really feel that we belong in a place, we, we need to to feel safe in that place. And I I truly admire those who who, who are brave enough to to say that. Top leaders who say that, yeah, guys, we need to work on this. It doesn't mean that we we we're doing something wrong necessarily. Yeah, for sure. There's something some things we could do better, but we need to work on our psychological safety. It is this is uh, this is risky business, you know. Going to to Amy Edmondson's definition of psychological safety is about this uh, the interpersonal risk taking that that we need to 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 address. Uh, we need safety to to be honest with each other, come up with ideas, show us show our vulnerability, our fallibility, um, and. The moment we can can do this in a in a, in a normal way, stop like being the uh, or pretending that it's just the other guys who need to work on their psychological safety. This isn't a problem at our place. <laughs> no, it's it, it. We're not talking about problems. We're not. We're talking about yeah. This is uh, it is a there's a risky element here of of mm. being honest with each other. It costs some of us mm. uh, some some something from us, um, but we need to do it. And we need some safety to do that. So, so let's work on this safety. Um, I've, I've met some really admiring um, top leaders mm. who have just in front of all their colleagues said that, yeah, this this isn't just something you guys uh, need to work on. This is something I need to work on. This is something we in the top management team need to work on. Mm. That is so much more important than than uh, those words are mm. just so important for, for how this is going to be lived out, uh, not just a psychological safety program that mm. you you guys on the floor need to work on. Let's normalize this psychological safety um, topic to to include everyone because we all all need it. I think that's you 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 jumped on the word vulnerability, and I think for me vulnerability is such a key word because vulnerability means you, you, you're you a little doubtful, you're a little scared, a little apprehensive, maybe a little even anxiety, but through vulnerability, that means you find the courage and the confidence to have that. For me, that's true strength when you're, and especially if it's coming from a leader, because he or she, when they speak it, it kind of opens the doors. It's, it's okay to talk about this, but unless a leader or someone with authority within the corporation or organization team speaks to it it stays hidden and when you speak to vulnerability as hard as it is for all of us to expose our sort of our chest right you know once we do that we take down the defenses of our arms and we do that I, I, I truly think that's real courage and that's uh, it takes real confidence and then that's where the real strength happens and then it, 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 I think that's the kickoff. That just that's the trigger, mm. and then things can roll on from there. It's not. I, I don't think it's ever easy, but it does get easier. I I totally agree. The the it, it will never get easy. No, that's 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 in the nature. But that's again why we need the safety to to address that those things that are not necessarily easy. That can feel a bit risky to to show who I really am. It's it's easier for me to just chatter along with whatever you said. It's easier for me to to pretend that I'm Superman, that I can fix these things myself. It costs a little bit of me to ask you for help, to admit that I didn't understand what you were saying. I may feel stupid if, if I ask this question, but still it's so important. So to, so to build that atmosphere of safety where we, where we feel free to do that, where we can make ourselves vulnerable, uh, where we can make a mistake. Because I've, I've for sure been there. That I thought that, board. As long as you're just pretending you're Superman, that's gonna that's gonna work. That's gonna build trust. That's then people are really gonna trust you when you are Superman, helping everybody else. But please don't let every, anyone help you, because then you're a weak guy. Yeah, you know what? I I I was there, and I'm not saying that. Twenty years later, I'm I'm uh, I, I I love making mistakes, and I, I always love making myself vulnerable for everyone. This is gonna, always going to cost something, but yeah. I'm glad that it it's a bit easier, as you say, because <laughs> yeah. I 
I'm a better leader. I'm a better colleague, and I I, mm. I thrive more at work when I'm when I can stop pretending that I'm someone I don't. I'm, I'm not, and and so so I built some some safety along the way because I've understood uh, and been told, getting really important mm. feedback from those around me who had, who had really told me that board, it's okay that you messed up. Mm. I don't trust you less. I trust you more now that I see that you're as fallible as I am. Uh, I trust you more now that, that when I see see more of who you are. I've made as many mistakes uh, as a leader as the days I have been a leader. Uh, and I'm still going to do it. I'm still going to try to perform. I'm not going to try to make mistakes, but I'm, I, I will make mistakes because I'm a fallible human being. And, and to create that that room, that atmosphere, I've been dependent, dependent upon that. And luckily, I've had a lot of good people around me who have, who have showed me that, given me that room to still believe in me, even though they've seen me from my weak sides. And, and I owe that to the people I lead and work with to, to try. As, as, and I will probably also fail sometimes, but I'm, I'm still going to try to create that room around me where, where you also can feel that it's, it's okay to be as fallible as, as board is. You know, board. If I could uh, bottle that mindset you have, and then bring it down to one pill, <laughs> I would make a fortune. Man, that's exactly a really good place to be. But I'm not selling drugs, folks. Oh, okay, <laughs> I'm not okay. The board's mindset. But if I could, <laughs> uh, I'm respectful of your time. I just have okay, a couple okay. more questions, board. I was just sure. wondering. We were talking about onboarding and new people and mm-hmm. creating an inclusive environment. How can psychological safety intersect with diversity, equity, and inclusion? You know, those efforts that corporations and organizations are trying to do in their workplace. I was wondering if you have any experience or any points you could share on that. I have some points because um, I, I haven't I haven't studied that myself, but but I read mm. some some studies and. We, we we talk a lot about diversity, uh, yeah. At our school, uh, mm-hmm. we talk a lot about it in, in the society as well, uh, for many good reasons. Um, talking about diversity when it comes to collaboration, teamwork, that you and I being different. Mm-hmm. Let's be honest; that can be a challenge. Uh, regardless of which parameter we're we're different on, that that may challenge us. But still, our differences are is our strength. It is. A great potential in that. So, so we need to keep talking about the diversity because that's really what it's because we are different that we can achieve something more together than we would have done by ourselves. So we need this diversity. All organizations need it, but we can't only talk about diversity as some percentage of of gender balance or or some some number that we need to reach. We need to talk about how we face these differences. We need to talk about tolerance and inclusion. Uh, and, and we not only need to talk about it, we need to live that out. That is something I see both in my own research and from other studies. Organizations that that actually put these, these thoughts into to action. How do we then include each other? Not only are, are bragging about, yeah, we reached the, the percentage mark of 40% uh, uh, women in our boardrooms or, or other points that we work towards. Yes, yes, we, we do that as well. But we are focused on how we make the best out of our differences. I guess that is what, what I uh, want to uh, remind us all. Inclusion and tolerance for our diversity that is what we really depend on uh, to make to make the best out of diversity uh, in at, at our in our workplaces. You know, that's one thing coming from Canada. I mean, you, you jump on a bus in Toronto or a subway or uh, a trick uh, a streetcar. Yeah, it's. It's, 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 it's a rainbow of different people. I mean, mm. the city is just so blended. And when you talk about inclusion and diverse, don't, don't, don't get me wrong. Toronto has a lot of its own problems, but as a society for me, it was always um, a good characterization of a mixture of cultures and genders and whatever other makes that makes us human in, in this one metropolis that we call Toronto. And I think, 
it becomes we can shrink that down and we can see that as a micro microcosm of a, of a team of, of a department and so i think a lot of what you said really resonates with me just from my background from where i come from and moving here and working in sort of the the nordics and the Scandi scandinavian companies and i see there's more and more attention and they're becoming more cognizant of of these terms and i think the pandemic has served that well in, in a twisted sense to make us more hyper aware of how important this is this connective tissue and this the sense of stability we have psychologically so everything you've said with me it just it really resonates with me it was just i, I found this conversation board very engaging because i i see you come from a different part and having someone of your your caliber and your depth and your studies really kind of helps me to understand that maybe what I am doing or helping to do <laughs> is making some inroads. <laughs> so it's very encouraging for me. So it's like, okay, <laughs> the expert told me I'm doing it well, so I must be doing it well. <laughs> I don't know if I'm an expert. Yeah, I, I know a lot about this in, in the mm -hmm. theory, but still I'm, as I said, I've uh, mm -hmm. done mistakes all the way and I'm going to sure. keep doing that. Um, I'm probably... I want to encourage us all uh, mm. to to focus on how we we ourselves can contribute mm. to the safety around us. The, we can always talk about what our leaders uh, should and shouldn't do. And, and yes, there's always an extra responsibility on our leaders, but but we can all we are all responsible, mm. I would say, for the safety around us, and we can all contribute to that uh, by being aware of of how we affect those around us. I can be aware that if, if I acknowledge you, if I show you that interest and respect, uh, I, I contribute positively to your your safety. So, so I, I hope uh, that is something the the listeners here can can take with them into their uh, to their days. That um, th think highly of mm -hmm. of the impact you can make around you when it comes to these uh, these matters that we have been uh, talking about and this um, this was really inspiring jason uh, we could probably talk uh, for many hours about this and uh, i would love to continue the conversation at a later uh, occasion uh, with, um, mm -hmm. and i i love your your take on this as well with the neuroscience and other it's very I feel that I can learn much, much more about this as well. Let's let's uh, continue the conversation at at some other point. Well, thank you, Bor, very much for your time and your generosity, sharing your your research, your your knowledge, and your experience with us today. Thank you, Jason. Great being here. Well, folks, that was Bord Fien, PhD scholar and the go-to person for psychological safety. And a personal thank you for me, Board. I'm very grateful for you spending that extended hour with me and my listeners today to speak from your experience, your research, and your know-how. For me, the conversation was invaluable. You know, it's added so much nuance and vibrancy to my understanding about the importance and the significance of psychological safety. So thanks again, Board. For any of you interested in reaching out to Board, I will leave all his contact information in the show notes. You know, in my conversation today with Board, you know, a lot of things became very salient to me. But in no particular order, there were four major things that stood out to me. Well, is that psychological safety is about inclusion. It's to satisfy the need to connect and belong. It's to feel safe to be yourself and to be accepted for who you are. It's that ability to learn, to satisfy that need to learn and, and grow by asking questions. It's about giving and receiving feedback. It's about experimenting and making mistakes. A third point for me was the con contribution part. It's that satisfaction, that, that, that the need we have to make a difference, to feel safe, to make a meaningful contribution to the group, to the team. And for me, another point was the challenger. And that was the ability to satisfy the need to make things better, to improve, to feel safe to speak up and to challenge the status through constructive dialogues. Thank you for joining me for another week and thank you for your support, your feedback and the comments that you share with me on a weekly basis. It, it means a lot to me to get that feedback. And if I may, to a call to action, if you could please subscribe, rate, and review this episode in the podcast, I'd appreciate it. And if you could spread the word by speaking to two friends, two colleagues, and two family members about the message of this podcast, I'd really appreciate that too. 
Anyways, until next week, until the next time we speak, keep well, keep strong, and we'll speak soon. Bye.